cool. Maybe the comic book on the next page will help to straighten things out. The top secret truth about Captain Underpants. Once upon a time, there was two cool kids named George and Harold. We the boss bat daddies. Me too. They had a really mean principal named Mr. Krupp. Blah, blah, blah. One day, they hypnotized him. He will obey us. They made him believe he was a superhero. You were now Captain Underpants. Okay. It was funny at first. Tra la la! Ha 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 ha! But then Mr. Krupp jumped out the window. Wait! Mr. Krupp really thought he was Captain Underpants. He got in lots of trouble. Come back, Bob! No way! I'm a hero! One time a big monster attacked the school. Rawr! It tried to eat up Mr. Krupp. George found some superpower juice in a UFO. Glub glub, drink up, bub. Then Mr. Krupp got superpowers. Pow! Now he can even fly and stuff. Tra la la! The worst part is, whenever Mr. Krupp or somebody snap their fingers, he turns into Captain Underpants. And whenever Captain Underpants gets water on his head, he turns back into Mr. Krupp. Blah, blah, blah! So anyways, in our last adventure, there was an evil guy named Tippy Tinkle Trousers. That's me! He built a big robo-suit. Then he climbed inside. I'm going to destroy Captain Underpants. Oh, yeah? Then they got in a big fight. Behold my ice ray. Zong, miss me. Tippy accidentally froze his feet to the ground. Oh, no, my feet are froze. Ha ha. Clink. Rats, you broke my robot. But Tippy's robot pants was also a time machine. I'm going to escape by going back in time. Oh, no! Tippy's robo pants went back in time five years ago. But some bullies saw the robo pants and got scared. Yeah! They all got so scared, they all went bonkers. Doi, doi, goo goo gaga, me go boom boom. Mr. Krupp got blamed for the whole thing. You're fired, Superintendent. I'm a victim of circumstance. Now, the future has changed. Everything is different. Since Mr. Krupp got fired five years ago, why me? He never got hypnotized by George and Harold. Since Mr. Krupp didn't get hypnotized, boo-hoo, he never turned into Captain Underpants. Since Captain Underpants doesn't exist, who's that? He wasn't there to save the world. Who'll save us? Beats me. Tippy realizes his mistake when he comes back came back to the present. Oh no, the world got destroyed. All oh, because I scared those bullies. Tippy vowed to make things right. I will fix this mess. But then, uh-oh. Stump, who will save us now? Chapter 1, George and Harold. This is George Beard and Harold Hutchins. George is a zi giant zombie nerd on the left with the tie and the flat top. Harold is a giant zombie nerd on the right with the t-shirt and the bad haircut. Remember that now. If you read our last adventure, you may recall the final terrifying scene where Tippy Tingle Trousers ended up cowering beneath the gigantic foot of Zombie Nerd Harold. You were probably horrified when the super-sized shoe slammed down to the ground, leaving behind a squishy red stain. You may even have commented on the surprising inappropriateness of such a murderous and bloody scene appearing in a children's book. It's fun to feel offended, isn't it? Unfortunately, I'm sorry I have to tell you that there was no murder at the end of the last book. There wasn't even any blood. What happened at the end of our last story is something called misdirection. It's what happens when you are led to believe that something is true, but in reality it's not true at all. Misdirection happens in a lot, of real, a lot in real life, especially in politics, history, education, medicine, marketing, science, religion, and the Oprah Winfrey Network. Slow zombies at play. With all that misdirection out there, life can get a little confusing. But don't worry, this epic novel contains no misdirection whatsoever. This legendary tome will explain everything, from our recent narrative complexities to the vast mysteries of our universe. By the time you get to page 210, you'll know it all. You'll be a genius. You'll be smarter than the most brilliant scientist who ever walked the earth. So let's get started, shall we? If you've ever been to the zoo, you might have noticed that really big creatures move kind of slowly. Take elephants, for example. They don't move very fast, even when they're in a hurry. 
Sure, they might cover a lot of ground, but that's only because they're so big. If you were to shrink an elephant down to the size of a house cat, you'd be shocked at how long it takes for them to get from one place to another. They're so darn slow that it wouldn't be long before somebody changed the story of the tortoise and the hare into the more appropriate, the miniature elephant and the hare. It's the same thing with the lunchroom zombie nerds. Sure, they're big and scary and stuff, but they move really slowly. So if a zombie nerd ever lifts his foot over you with the intent of stomping you into a puddle, don't worry, you actually have a few minutes before you're in any real danger. Tippy found this out the hard way. When zombie nerd Harold lifted his foot above Tippy's head, Tippy screamed in horror. Then Tippy screamed again, and again. Then he checked his watch and screamed some more. Finally, Tippy's voice got a little scratchy from all that screaming, so he got up and walked over to one of the few remaining stores on the planet to buy some cherry throat lozenges. While he was there, he purchased a new suit and bow tie, read part of a magazine, and got a foot massage. On his way out of the store, Tippy noticed an extra large novelty ketchup pack that was on sale, so he bought it and dragged it back to the scene of the crime. Zombie nerd Harold's shoe was still coming down slowly as Tippy placed the extra large novelty ketchup pack under it and walked away. Tippy climbed back into his robo pants just as zombie nerd Harold's shoe hit the pavement and crushed a giant novelty ketchup pack. A bright red stain squished out from beneath the zombified shoe as Tippy's robo pants disappeared in a crackling glow of light. You see, Tippy had mistakenly caused some trouble the last time he had gone back in time, so he had to go back again to undo the damage he had done. But before I can tell you that story, I have to give you this warning. Chapter 2, Let's Get Serious, Folks! Did you ever notice how grown-ups hate it when kids are having fun? Seriously, when was the last time you were doing something fun and some adult came over and made you stop? If you're like most kids, you're probably reading this very book because some adult wanted you to quit playing video games or watching TV. If you don't believe me, try this experiment. Grab a few of your friends, go into the corner of a room, and start goofing around. Make some noise! Start laughing and cheering and maybe shout a woohoo or two! It's been scientifically proven that 89.4% of all grown-ups will drop whatever they're doing and rush over to put a stop to whatever nonsense you're up to. You'll have to wonder, why are most grown-ups like this? Weren't they ever kids themselves? Didn't they enjoy laughing and cheering and goofing around when they were young? If so, when did they stop? And why? Now, I certainly can't speak for all adults, but I'm going to anyway. I think it's a lot easier for adults to stomp out someone else's fun than it is for them to reflect on their own lives and figure out where it all went so miserably wrong. It's just too depressing for grown-ups to ponder all the decades of compromises, failures, laziness, fear, and regrettable choices that slowly transform them from running, jumping, laughing, fun-loving kids into grumpy, complaining, calorie-counting, easily offended, peace and quiet-demanding grouches. In other words, it's harder to look within yourself than it is to shout, Hey, you kids, cut that out! Keeping this in mind, you might not want to smile or laugh while reading this book, and when you get to the flipperama parts, I suggest you flip with a bored, disinterested face. Look on your face, or some adult will probably take this book away from you and make you read Sarah Plain and Tall instead. Don't say I didn't warn you. Chapter 3, Tippy Returns Again! Tippy Tingle Trousers was in big trouble. He had zapped himself back in time five years and accidentally frightened four bullies. This thoughtless mistake set in motion a series of events that ultimately got Mr. Crop fired. And since there was no Mr. Crop, there was no Captain Underpants. And since there was no Captain Underpants, there was nobody to save the world from the terrible dis devastation caused by the villains from our three epic novels. Tippy decided more, there was only one thing to do. Go back in time and stop himself from scaring those bullies. But in order to do this, he would have he would have to go back in time before the last time he had gone back in time. So Tippy set his Tinkle Time Travelometer for ten minutes before the last time he had arrived in the past and pressed the Away We Go button. After several seconds of made-for-television-styled special effects, Tippy found himself transported to the awful night of the terrifying thunderstorm. Everything looked very familiar. He knew at any moment the four bullies would come running from the school and tear across the football field. 
Then they would come face to face with him, well, a slightly younger version of him, and only he could stop it all from happening. Tippy hid behind the side of the school and waited as the wind howled ferociously. Suddenly, a brilliant flash of lightning struck a nearby power line. The electricity in the school went out, and all the windows became dark. Tippy listened closely and heard the sounds of squealing and slapping and shuffling. It sounded as if a terrible struggle was taking place inside the school. Then suddenly, the back door of the school crashed open, and the four petrified bullies shoved their way outside. Quickly, they darted toward the football field. This was Tippy's big chance. He aimed his Freezy Beam 4000 at the running delinquents and zapped them all with a mini mountain of molecularly modified ice. The four bullies were frozen in place. Tippy scanned the boys with his life systems monitor and found them to be perfectly preserved. The carbonite and Tabana gas infused ice had been programmed to remain solid for 15 minutes, just long enough for Tippy to do his thing. Quickly, Tippy turned the football field turned toward the football field where a ball of blue lightning was growing bigger and bigger. Suddenly, it exploded in a blinding flash. And there, where the ball of lightning had been, was a pair, giant pair of robotic pants. Boys, that was a close one, said a voice from inside the depths of the newly arrived robot pants. Captain Underpants is a lot stronger than I thought. The zipper of the newly arrived robotic trousers opened, and a tiny man peeked out to marvel at the world of five years ago. But to his surprise, he saw an incidental copy of himself staring straight at him and tapping his gigantic robot foot impatiently. Who are you? asked the newly arrived Tippy. I'm you, shouted to future Tippy. You're from the future. What's going on? asked Tippy. I'm here to stop you from scaring those kids over there, said future Tippy, pointing at the frozen bullies. Why, said Tippy, what's so important about those kids? I have no idea, said future Tippy. All I know is I scared those kids when I came back here last time, and apparently it caused a chain reaction that resulted in the total dis destruction of the Earth, more or less. I see, said Tippy, so what do we do now? Future Tippy looked at his watch. Those, those kids are going to saw out in 8 minutes and 11 seconds, he said. We've got to be gone by then. So he reached into the cockpit of his robo-pants and grabbed one of his very first inventions, the Shrinky Pig 2000. Tippy aimed it at the younger version of himself and pressed a button. Zook! A powerful beam of energy blasted in the newly arrived Tippy Chinkle trousers and his gigantic pair of robo-pants and shrunk them down to the size of a baseball. Big Tippy reached down and picked up the tiny version of himself. What did you do that for? shouted Tiny Tippy. I can't very well have two of us running around, said Big Tippy. I got to keep an eye on you. Big Tippy tucked Tiny Tippy into his jacket pocket and checked his watch again. Four minutes and sixteen seconds, he muttered to himself. He looked over at the four bullies encased in the now cracking ice mound. Big Tippy turned to his Tinkle Time travelometer and programmed it for a date in the future. Time was running out. The ice around the bullies was disintegrating fast, so Tippy sneaked away to the center of town, pressed his Away We Go button, and disappeared into a ball of blue lightning. Two seconds later, the ice mound that had encased and preserved the bullies disintegrated completely. Without skipping a beat, the four frightened friends continued their mad dash away from the school. As they ran across the football field toward their homes, something about Kipper and his friends changed forever. They will never be again be the same despicable bullies they once were. Chapter 4 Fixing the Future Big Tippy, it says, Tinkle Time Travelometer for a sunny noon in October, four years in the future. He arrived, as usual, in a giant ball of blue lightning that grew bigger and bigger until it exploded in a blinding flash. What's going on out there? cried Tiny Tippy. I can't see a thing! Shush, Big Tippy, as he showed Tiny Tippy down to the deep, darkened depths of his jacket pocket. Big Tippy listened carefully. He heard the voice of a child muttering, This can't be good. Tippy unzipped the zipper out of his robo-pants and peeked out. To his delight, the world looked like he usually did. No destruction, no giant zombie nerds, no moon rocks. Everything seemed pretty normal. Hey, it's Professor Poopy Pants, shouted a small boy, whom Tippy recognized immediately. Suddenly, two cops standing nearby started a laugh which angered Tippy. Stop laughing, shouted Tippy. 
My name is no longer Professor Poopy Pants. I change it to Tippy Tinkle Trousers. The two cops laughed even harder. And I've got a special surprise for anybody who thinks my new name is funny, said the furious professor. Tippy pressed the button on his Freezy Beam 4000, causing it to rise from the depths of his robo pants. He set the freeze ray for 20 minutes and zapped the cops, transforming them into frozen statues. My Freezy Beam 4000 will take care of anybody who stands in my way, said Tippy. And now, he said with a wicked smile, it's time for my revenge. Oh no, screamed George. Here we go again, screamed Harold. Tippy chased George and Harold and their two pets, Sulu and Crackers, through town, zapping his Freezy Bean 4000 at them and laughing maniacally. The chase lasted all afternoon and into the night. The four friends hid behind buildings, inside trash bins, under bridges, and even down the sewer. But it didn't matter where they saw refuse because Tippy Tinkle Trousers always found them. By the morning of the next day, our heroes had found a hiding place behind some bushes near the park. What are we going to do, whispered George. There's nowhere else to hide. I don't know, whispered Harold. George and Harold looked at their two pets, shivering them in the morning mist. Shivering with them in the morning mist. We're not going to make it, whispered George. But there's no reason that Sulu and Cracker should have to suffer. Harold's eyes began to water. You're right, he whispered. George and Harold petted their two friends sadly as they devised a plan to return to the dinosaur age. We could use a purple potty to take Crackers back home where we found him, said George. Yeah, said Harold, and Sulu could stay there with him. They'll both be safe there. As soon as it was clear, the four friends sneaked away from the bushes and headed for Jerome Horowitz Elementary School, carefully avoiding major streets and intersections. It was almost noon by the time George and Harold and their two pets reached the school. Cautiously, they sneaked through the front door and dashed up to the stairs to the library. Hey, Bob, shouted Mr. Crop angrily. Where have you kids been? George and Harold looked down and saw Mr. Crop carrying a large cardboard box. Well, Mr. Crop shouted, get down here and explain yourselves. George and Harold looked at their two pets and continued running up the stairs. Mr. Crop was furious. His day hadn't started out very well. For some strange reason, all the red curtains in his office had been disappearing and he wasn't happy about it. So Mr. Crop had driven angrily to the store, bought a replacement box of curtains, started a big fight with the cashier, got a flat tire on the way home, and now his truant students were bringing animals into his school, ignoring his commands and running up the stairs. You kids get back here, shouted Mr. Crop as he chased after the four fighting friends. George and Harold and Crackers and Sue raced atop top of the stairs, dashed into the library, and locked the door behind them. There they beheld the old troublesome nemesis, the Purple Potty. It was a homemade time machine that had a few quirks, to say the least, and our heroes approached it cautiously. Do you still remember how to use this thing? asked Harold. Of course, said George. We just used it yesterday morning. All I have to do was set the controller for 65 million years ago, then pull down on the chain. Easy, squeezy, mac and cheesy. Suddenly, Mr. Crop reached the library door and struggled with the locked doorknob. The boys heard a shuffling sound fall by the jingling of keys. Let's boogie, cried George. The four friends climbed into the purple potty and George closed the door. At that very moment, Mr. Crop came crashing through the library door with his box of red curtains. He ran to the purple potty and banged on the door. I know you're in there, he screamed. You can't hide from me forever. Hurry, cried Harold as George fiddled with the controller. We gotta get out of here. I'm working as fast as I can, cried George. Suddenly, a gigantic dark shadow filled the library. Mr. Crop turned Mr. Crop turned to see a huge robotic pair of trousers at the window. The zipper unzipped. And Tippy Tinkle Trousers peeked through the cabinet's opening. I've got you now, he shouted. Ha, ha, ha. Tippy reached for a button on his Freezy Beam 4000 as Mr. Crop cowered in horror. At that very moment, George finished shutting the controller for 65 million years ago. Then he pulled down on the chain. All at once, there was a brilliant flash of green light, and the purple potty along a Mr. Crop in his cardboard box disappeared into a whirlwind of electrified ozone. 
Chapter 5, Tiny Tippy's Tremendous Task. Rats, screamed Tippy as he watched the purple potty disappear. Those kids have a time machine and I don't know where they went. What's going on? cried Tiny Tippy from the depths of Big Tippy's pocket. I can't see a thing. Those kids took off in a time machine, Big Tippy barked at the miniature version of himself. And they took Captain Underpants with them. Where did they go? asked Tiny Tippy. How should I know? Big Tippy yelled. Hey, I've got an idea, said Tiny Tippy. Why don't I go back in time and find out? Good idea, me, said Big Tippy. He reached down and placed Tiny Tippy in the library. You'll go back in time ten minutes and listen to everything they said. Then when I show up, tell me where they went. You got it, said Tiny Tippy. He set his tinkle time travel on for ten minutes ago, and in a blue crackling instant, he was gone. Tiny Tippy arrived in the same spot he had left, only it was now ten minutes earlier. He heard some people running up the stairs, so he decided to hide behind a trash can. Suddenly, George Harold and their two pets dashed into the room and locked the door behind them. Tiny Tippy watched as his boys tiptoed toward the tall, time-traveling toilet. Do you still remember how to use this thing? asked Harold. Of course, said George. We just used it yesterday morning. All I have to do is set the controller for 65 million years ago, then pull down on the chain. Easy squeezy, mac and cheesy. Aha, muttered Tiny Tippy. They're going back in time to the Mesozoic era. Tiny Tippy watched as the four friends climbed into the time machine and closed the door. He saw Mr. Krupp crash through the library door and bang on the lavender lavatory. Then he saw himself, the big version of himself, that is, appear at the window. I've got you now, shouted Big Tippy. Ha, ha, ha. Suddenly, there was a brilliant flash of green light, and the purple potty, along with Mr. Krupp's cardboard box, disappeared into a whirlwind of electrified ozone. Rats, screamed Tippy as he watched the purple potty disappear. Those kids have a time machine, and I don't know where they vent. I do, said Tiny Tippy as he stepped out from behind the garbage can. Who are you, asked Big Tippy. I'm Tiny Tippy, said Tiny Tippy. That's impossible, said Big Tippy. Tiny Tippy is right here. He reached into his pocket and pulled out the miniature version of himself who had been complaining because he couldn't see a thing. I'm ten minutes older than that guy, said Tiny Tippy. You sent me back in time so I could find out where those kids went to. Oh, I get it, said Big Tippy. Good idea, me. So where'd they go? They went backwards in time to 65 million years ago, said Tiny Tippy. Aha, said Big Tippy and slightly younger Tiny Tippy to themselves simultaneously. They're going back in time to the Mesozoic era. Big Tippy picked up Tiny Tippy and showed him, shoved him into his pocket next to slightly younger Tiny Tippy. Let's go, up. I'll go back to the dinosaur age, shall we? If we time it right, we can get there just before that purple potty arrives. Chapter 6, 65 million years ago. The primitive midday sky lit up with several blinding flashes as the purple potty suddenly appeared in the top of an ancient tree. George and Harold had successfully brought crackers back to where they had found him. But when they opened the door of the purple potty, they discovered that they also bought a stowaway. What the heck is going on here? cried Mr. Crop as he hung from a branch high up in the treetop. Oh no! cried George. Mr. Crop must have been standing too close to the purple potty when we zapped backwards in time. He got zapped back with us. Harold reached out his hand to grab hold of Mr. Crop. How could things get any worse? he asked. Suddenly the tree started to shake. Boom, 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 went the tree. George and Harold looked down and saw Tippy's gigantic robo-pants kicking the side of the tree. What's he doing here, cried Harold. I don't know, said George, but I think we're about to fall. The horrible kicking continued and the tree shook wildly. Finally, the purple potty slid sideways and toppled over. We're doomed, screamed Harold as they all fell. The purple potty cracked and split apart as it tumbled down the side of the tree. Mr. Crop fell too, smacking against every branch on the way down. Suddenly, the purple potty hit the ground with a terrible crash and broke apart into a thousand pieces. Mr. Krupp hit the ground too, but was surprised to find out that he wasn't hurt a bit. Big Tippy kicked through the wreckage of the purple potty but could not find any trace of George and Harold or their pets. Where did they go? he asked. Look, up there, cried the two tiny Tippies who were picking out Big Tippy's pocket. Crackers had grabbed George and Harold and Sulu at the last second. Good boy, Crackers, cried George. You saved us. Not for long, screamed Big Tippy as he peered peevishly from a porthole on top of his robo-pants. 
Trojan Harold looked down at Mr. Krupp, who was still trying to figure out how he'd fallen 60 feet and not gotten hurt. The two boys snapped their fingers. Suddenly, a welcome smile spread across Mr. Krupp's face. Immediately, he pulled off his shoes and socks. Then he unclipped his tie and ripped off his shirt. He grabbed a red curtain from the cardboard box beside him and tied it around his neck as he wiggled out of his pants. Captain Underpants was back! And Tippy Tinkle Trousers and his two tiny twins were in for the fight of their lives. Chapter 7, Two Tiny Traitors George and Harold ran through the thick jungle foliage with Crackers and Sulu flying above them. Captain Underpants decided to tag along too, just for fun. Big Tippy jumped onto the back of a nearby Tyrannosaurus Rex and chased after them. You can't run forever, shouted Big Tippy. When I catch you guys, I'm gonna tear you apart. Can we help? asked the two tiny Tippies who were tucked away in Big Tippy's jacket pocket. No, yelled Big Tippy sternly. You two keep quiet while I take care of business. This is a job for a man, not two little twerps like you. As the chase continued, the two tiny tippies grumbled to themselves. Boy, I'm getting tired of that giant truck bossing us around, said Tiny Tippy. Me too, said slightly younger Tiny Tippy. He thinks he's such a big shot just because he's huge. I sure wish I still had my Goosey Girl 4000, said Tiny Tippy. Then I could make myself big again. I was just thinking the same thing, said slightly younger Tiny Tippy. But unfortunately, we stored the Goosey Girl 4000 in the top half of our robo suit, and Captain Underpants destroyed it back in chapter 8 of our last epic novel. Hey, cried Tiny Tippy, why don't we go back, er, uh, I mean forward in time to chapter 8 of our last epic novel? We could grab that Goosey Girl 4000 and make ourselves gigantic. I like the way you think me, said slightly younger Tiny Tippy. So while Big Tippy chased everybody through the treacherous jungles of the Cretaceous period, the two tiny Tippies set their tinkle time travelometers for the might of the big battle from Chapter 8 of our last epic novel. Big Tippy was so engrossed in his pursuit of our heroes, he didn't even notice the teensy-weensy blue sparks of flashing light emanating from his pocket as his two previous devious doppelgangers disappeared in a whiff of primeval troposphere.